Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Aranza Zugalan and I'm a member of the Build-Up editorial team. Welcome to Build-Up, the European Commission's portal for energy efficiency and renewable energy in buildings. Directly stemming from the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, BuildUp is the meeting place for everyone involved in making the European building and construction sector more energy efficient. Every month we focus on a topic that is key to making Europe's buildings as energy efficient as possible. Exploring that, you can find the latest content such as expert talks, webinars, case studies and more. From architects and engineers to academics and policy makers, we've got you covered. BuildUp brings together thousands of registered members to reap the benefit of Europe's collective intelligence on all aspects of energy efficiency and renewable energy in buildings. The BuildUp portal benefits from the expertise of our ambassadors. Drawn from industry and academia, the ambassadors bridge the gap between EU and national level and help shape our editorial content. Want to promote your work? BuildUp disseminates your research, projects and events through a variety of channels. Become a member to exchange knowledge with your peers. You can disseminate tools and resources, share good practices and consult open source publications. Join the discussion on social media and become part of the BuildUp community or subscribe to our newsletter to receive the latest news. However you participate, the BuildUp portal is here to inspire, inform and connect. BuildUp, the European portal for energy efficiency and renewable energy in buildings. Join the community for opportunities and updates. It is a pleasure for BuildUp to host today's event which is both a webinar and also a book launch for the recent book title Occupant Centric Simulation Aided Building Design. The webinar event will provide an overview of the entire book going chapter by chapter in addition to having two dedicated sessions for questions from the audience and discussions with the authors. Today's agenda We'll jump straight into presentations of the book chapters, beginning with an overview of chapter one and the book's introduction from Lion O'Brien, full professor at uh, Carleton University. Chapter two, Fundamentals of Internal Environmental Quality and Occupant Needs, is presented by Christian Berger, assistant professor at Alborg University. Chapter three, Occupants in the Building Design Decision Making Process, will be presented by Clarice Blaise de Souza. Professor at Car Cardiff University. Clinton Andrews, Professor, Center Director and Associate Dean of Rutgers University will then present chapter four, methods uh, to obtain the occupant perspective. Before our first Q&A session, Lyon O'Brien, full professor at Carlton University, will present chapter five, occupant centric performance, performance metrics and performance targets. We will then take a short break from presentations for a quick Q&A session, so we encourage the audience to send us questions at any point during today's session. After the first Q&A, Lion O'Brien will continue and present Chapter 6, Introduction to Occupant Modeling. Chapter 7, Fit for Purpose Occupant Modeling, Choosing the Best Approach, will be presented by Isabella Gaitani, Senior Research Scientist at Arup Smart Buildings. Farha Tamasevi, Lecturer at University College London will then present Chapter 8, Advanced Simulation Methods for Occupant-Centric Building Design. Chapter 9, Building Interfaces, Design and Considerations for Simulation will be presented by Philip Aji, Assistant Professor at Virginia Tech. Budat Gunai, Assistant Professor at Carleton University will then present Chapter 10, Design of Sequences of Operation for Occupant-Centric Controls. For the final presentation of the day, we will hear again from Lion O'Brien, who will present the last chapter, chapter 11, Detailed Case Studies. To round off today's event, we will have a second Q&A session with all the speakers. <music> 
We invite and encourage the audience to send us questions through the GoToWebinar platform that can be answered during the Q&A uh, discussions. Please specify if your question is for a specific speaker or if it's for all speakers to answer. You will be able to find the webinar recording on the Build Up portal and our YouTube channel in the coming days together with the presentation slides. Now, without further hesitation, we will move directly to our first speaker of today, Lyon O'Brien, full professor of Carleton University. Lyon, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so it's my pleasure to present our book, um, which has about 40 contributors, and you'll hear from uh, a dozen of them or so today. Uh, but I just wanted the audience to know that this book is made of many uh, different expertise, and thank goodness, because it's a challenging problem. Excuse me, I overshot. Um, okay, so what was the motivation for this book? I mean, I think most of the authors um, had this overwhelming feeling that occupants just have not been properly uh, brought into the building design process. It's often um, an, an oversight, and I think the results are clear. And we're gonna look at a few examples of that today where the occupants just weren't considered um, for one reason or another. And, and maybe I'll jump right to the photo on the right, uh, which is one of my favorite examples illustrating this. It's a, uh, a condo building in Ottawa where the washroom, the, the, the toilet, the restroom, whatever you want to call it, wherever you're from, um, is fully exposed to the street below. Um, and this is likely because the architect was focused on how the building looked from the outside without a lot of regard for the privacy of the occupants. Um, but in general, um, many engineers have complained about occupants and that they lead to a performance gap, but they haven't necessarily done a good job of bringing occupants into the design process in a more constructive way, other than to, to blame occupants for a gap between uh, measured and predicted performance. Um, and one of the solutions to address uncertainty of occupants is to take away the adaptive opportunities from the occupants um, and try to automate our buildings so that the occupants have very little impact in performance. We also generally don't think that that's a good idea. Um, and we can see that uh, occupants are often left out on the sidelines, even in sort of best practices guidelines. Um, for example, this is from ASHRAE, um, which is a diagram showing how to consider occupants in the sort of overall heat balance of buildings. And you can see occupants are over at the side um, and they're seen as a, a passive um, input of heating, um, moisture and odors rather than a sort of dynamic um, participant of buildings and building performance. Um, so what we think in this group in general is that occupants in buildings are more of a two-way interaction. Um, and where this is important is that it recognizes that building design and building controls can influence occupant behavior, ideally positively. Um, so we know that if occupants are uncomfortable, they're not going to passively tolerate uh, uncomfortable conditions. They're going to actively try to improve their conditions. Um, and in many cases, this might involve energy intensive actions like opening a window in the middle of a cold winter. Um, but I think it's important not to blame the occupants, but rather recognize that occupants usually act rationally, um, whether or not the building has been designed rationally. Um, so before we go too much further, it's worth noting that this group has been brought together by a large project called IEA EVC Annex 79. Um, and the project just had its final meeting, but we've been meeting regularly and formally 10 times over the last five years. Um, and, and the project involves many uh, participating countries, uh, which is critical to this um, because we really need the diverse perspectives, um, not only from different disciplines, but different climates and, and cultures. So before we get into the book, I'll just give a, a brief overview of the structure. Um, there's 12 chapters. I just covered the first chapter in a nutshell. Uh, but the first half is very fundamental, looking at how do we um, or what are the needs of occupants? Um, how do we get those, those needs of occupants? How do we acquire them uh, specifically for, for unique occupants? How do we bring that into the design process? The second half is all about 
um, occupant modeling and simulation. Um, and, and sort of more advanced modeling to improve the design process and, and get more information, better information before we make design decisions. Um, then there's two chapters, one on occupant interfaces and one on controls, which we think are really important. Um, and finally, we conclude with some detailed case studies, which I will present. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to pass it to the next author, uh, Christiana. Thanks a lot for handing over, Liam. Um, yeah. Hi, as mentioned, my name is Christiane Berger, and on behalf of my colleagues, Marcel Schweiker, Julia Day, and Alicia Madavi, I'm going to briefly present to you uh, the second chapter uh, of this book uh, that is titled Fundamentals of Indoor Environmental Quality and Occupant Needs. So the purpose of this chapter is to provide a fundamental understanding of the relationship between the built environment and occupants' needs for health, well-being, and productivity. So the structure of this chapter is along the following listed headings. So after an introduction, we provide an overview of uh, some fundamentals and theories uh, related to occupants' perception and behavior in the built environment. Then we discuss some common compliance checking methods and practices regarding specifications of IQ. And finally, we are going to talk about several um, remaining challenges and open questions that still require some ongoing work. So I will now in the following um, talk about um, these uh, topics a little bit more in detail. So in the first part of uh, this chapter, uh, we provide and establish a conceptual framework, as you can see here uh, in this figure. So in this framework, uh, issues of occupant needs and physiological needs um, are at the center. Then we have taken a look at how that implies requirements for indoor built environment, and further, how that uh, translates to uh, requirements um, of building elements and building systems. In the second part of this chapter, we have taken a look at how this conceptual framework or this conceptual thinking actually translates uh, into practice. So typically code standards and guidelines are kind of the main vehicle to translate a state of knowledge uh, into, uh, yeah, standards uh, and codes and guidelines which um, inform practitioners and professionals and stakeholders. So in that context, we have taken a look at the current state um, of standards uh, and guidelines and also um, at potential weaknesses um, there might be. And um, here, for instance, you can see um, compare equations. So, um, uh, recommendations in that are included in thermal or visual uh, standards uh, typically based on relationships referred to as compare equations. So compare equations map independent measurable um, variables of independent environments to a construct, so two uh, dependent uh, variables uh, that capture subjective evaluations of occupants' uh, comfort. So, um, the knowledge that is gained um, has to be translated to measurable um, parameters. So uh, that is ob obviously a, a useful practice, but uh, there are also some issues that can be improved. For instance, when we're um, talking about transparency um, in, in standards. Which brings me also to um, the third part um, of uh, this chapter, in which we are um, discussing some remaining challenges and open questions that still require some ongoing work. So one challenge in the IQ and occupant in the IQ domain and occupants needs um, um, kind of topic um, refers to building controls or building interfaces. So. There have been many models and theories, um, for instance, with regard to perceived control uh, that have shown that occupant satisfaction and perception of the environmental quality is higher when occupants perceive um, that they have control um, of their uh, indoor environment. Uh, 
So in that context, designers uh, should encourage to give occupants uh, actual control of building uh, interfaces that are, first of all, uh, not hidden, uh, easily accessible and intuitive uh, to understand. So there is ob obviously still a lot of work um, to do in this area, for instance, to, to better understand how access to controls really impact uh, people's decision and people behaviors in, in the built environment. Uh, the second uh, challenges focuses on the impact of human building interactions on building energy's uh, use. So, for instance, issues um, may emerge when occupants uh, control or manipulate uh, the building in ways that the designers uh, did not intend to, or if the controls are not well thought through. And um, so there is obviously also ongoing work uh, in this area. And lastly, the, the third uh, challenge that, that I would like to highlight is um, the interaction among different inter-environmental quality domains and also other factors. So there are still certain factors and relationships between different inter-environmental quality domains that are not yet fully translated uh, into practice. So there is still much to learn and further understand in, in terms of how these different IQ domains and factors interact, interact and influence uh, each other and um, yeah, how these interactions impact uh, occupants' behavior. So to sum up, this chapter shows some relationships uh, between occupant needs and the environmental quality. And in that way, it gives a um, um, yeah, theoretical foundation for the following uh, chapters. And now I would like to hand over to Clarisse. Thank you, Christiane. Um, I'm Clarisse bleud sosen and uh, I'm here today to give you a taste of our book chapter on occupants in the building design decision-making process. Uh, a chapter that was done in collaboration with uh, Simon Tucker, uh, Jofi demi uh, Andra Scheidt, and Runa Helvig. So the chapter discusses the challenges of integrating uh, considerations of a building occupant and occupant behavior into the decision-making process of building designers and outlines a framework to achieve this. Um, I, sorry. sorry. So the framework that we propose is object-oriented, it's rich, easy to use, and it's compatible with building information management systems or BIM systems and building performance simulations. It builds on the overarching principle that the occupant's considerations must be formally integrated into building information management systems. So exchange of information between the team members and the different disciplines can happen in a timely and clear way. Using BIM systems and the new ISO standards as a starting point and considering that building operation now needs to be part of design agendas enable us to examine different types of design aims, requirements, considerations and decisions related to the fundamental elements of BIM models which are affected by or affect occupants. So initially, we looked at how design decisions impact on occupants within built spaces, considering that designers impose constraints, either consciously or unconsciously, on occupants by, for instance, defining how they can use spaces to fix furniture, use persuasive strategies towards specific behaviors through, for instance, automation and smart meters, design affordances with intended or unintended effects on how occupants use the building and might keep adaptive opportunities in mind when designing spaces which are significantly shaped by the way people use them. So we then discussed how decisions related to the four main BIM objects uh, such as built spaces, construction entities, construction elements and construction properties affect or are affected by occupants when interacting within and with these objects as well as with the environment of the wider site. For example, when uh, deciding about building orientation, designers might have to provide places for children to play in the sun, therefore influencing occupants' interactions within the building. And when deciding about evacuation routes, designers are likely to have to provide safe route to the outside, properly defining wayfinding for occupants to interact with the building in a safe way. Uh, 
So we notice that these interactions are complex uh, and context-based, but the design decisions about the building and its spaces are surprisingly typical because the design team has just a finite number of built spaces, construction entities, construction elements, and construction properties to manipulate towards achieving project goals. So if a design team wants to integrate considerations about occupants to design practice, the design team then needs to be prepared to record information about occupants throughout the design process in a structured way. So this information can then be easily shared and recalled as the design progresses. So we therefore propose the template, which you can see on the screen, which we call occupant-centric design patterns that captures decisions and objects in their design context. The template shows designers how a current design problem and its solution might affect occupants or is itself affected by occupants. These problem-solution pairs are a powerful way to transfer and share knowledge and quality control design solutions. They describe common situations where design decisions will affect or be affected by occupants and propose design solutions integrated to building performance simulation that will take this into account in a way that is user-friendly to designers. So uh, important parts of the problem statement, as you can see in red in the screen, include the context in which the pattern is inserted in, and therefore the context in which a decision needs to be made, a synthesis of the type of problem being dealt with, and an example showing where the pattern can be or was deployed, considering the relationship with occupancy, building performance simulation, and design practice. And finally, the solution space of the, the pattern includes aims of the pattern from a building performance simulation perspective, model settings for building performance simulation, and process and analysis involved in the use of simulation together with relevant outputs and interactions with the model that should be afforded in visualizations related to this pattern. So we presented in the book an example of this uh, in chapter three. Uh, which can then form part of a library of patterns better connecting design decisions with different types of performance to be simulated and assessed. We believe that these patterns can be a kind of a Lego of generic objects structured so they can be shareable, easy to recall and exchange, and opening the door for future work to implement them within common BIM tools to facilitate agility and distributivity in decision making. The patterns are transparent and traceable and enable information on potential solutions or best practice to make easily available and accessible to design teams. Uh, and we can then move from data processing to shared understanding by combining pattern recognition with context knowledge developed through concerted agreement among the different stakeholders. I thank you very much for hearing and invite you to read chapter three of the book, as well as my colleague Clinton Andrews to present chapter four. Thank you, Clarice. Um, I'd like to uh, talk through the methods to obtain the occupant perspective for a few minutes with you. And this is work uh, that I'm uh, sharing on behalf of Philip Adji, uh, Julia Day, Jennifer Senek, Rich Wenner, and a couple of others. And I want in the next couple of minutes to motivate this, talk about the nature of occupant behavior data, uh, the variety of methods and their uses, strengths, and weaknesses, uh, touch briefly on interface design and then offer a couple of final thoughts. Uh, so next slide, please. So first, a little motivation. There is a need to obtain the occupant's perspective at every stage in the building design, from uh, conceptual design, where it's important to establish occupant needs, through to design development, where this is going to be more about in, uh, defining engagement goals, um, at the level of construction documentation, uh, developing guidelines for how to operate the building and so forth. Um, during contract administration, it's going to be more about managing expectations. And finally, the long arc of um, uh, post-occupancy uh, is going to involve a lot of uh, need for uh, constructive tenant engagement. Next slide, please. Occupant data are actually uh, a little bit challenging. 
and especially for people who uh, have come up in, in let's say, uh, who have an engineering or uh, science background. And that's because there's both an objective dimension and a subjective dimension. And so uh, the objective evidence about occupant behavior is uh, helpful and possibly familiar. You know, we can measure occupancy patterns, we can measure indoor conditions, we can uh, look at how uh, how occupants respond to the conditions they find for themselves. We can measure what their bodies are doing. But at the same time, and equally important, our occupant perceptions of comfort, of their views about the degree of control they have over their environment, their satisfaction with that, and uh, their uh, preference. What do they say they want? And for all of these, uh, topics, we are going to need to ask people uh, what's going on. Next slide, please. There are a couple of intrinsic challenges that um, we encounter when we uh, want to use methods to obtain the occupant uh, perspective. And one is uh, very fundamental and, uh, you know, dare I use the word epistemological, you know, and that problem is that both the subject, the researcher, in other words, and the object of study, the occupant, are people. And that means that both are subject to social forces and to biases and prejudices and uh, 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 failures of various times, types. And so what that means is that when we think about trying to uh, gather data about the occupant uh, perspective, we're going to want to be humble. We're going to want to recognize that experts might not know a lot more than uh, regular people about what, uh, what's going on. We'll want to acknowledge uh, where we can the objective agreement on the material facts of the physical world. You know, let's agree on what that temperature is, even if we can't agree on whether it's a comfortable temperature. And uh, it's important that we let people speak for themselves as much as possible. And finally, to study people in their physical context where, uh, uh, and I'd add social context, where it's not just um, where are you and what are you doing, but what are the, you know, what what type of clothing is it customary to wear in this office or in this site, and how are people supposed to behave? Next slide, please. So uh, with that uh, sort of uh, introduction to the challenge. There are many methods for obtaining the occupant perspective. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see this list that there are a variety of self-reported and self-engaged methods, such as interviews and focus groups and charrettes, well, where people get to speak directly for themselves in various forms. Uh, there are, uh, they, they serve different purposes. You know, an interview is great for, um, uh, getting people to talk about what they perceive, uh, they will, they are not so great if you're trying to ask about uh, what happened a year ago or five years ago. Um, and so there are other tools such as diaries, um, ecological momentary assessments that uh, basically uh, bother people frequently to ask them simple questions to get a sense of how people are feeling right now that are also important. Additionally, there are a variety of observational and simulation methods, and that includes standing in, in a building and looking at what happens and writing it down, taking pictures, whether it's uh, still photos or video, uh, trying to do counts, uh, measuring occupancy levels, which rooms are occupied, as well as flow counters, how many people are passing from one room to another. We can also use uh, sensors uh, uh, such as carbon dioxide uh, measurement sensors that are proxies for occupancy. We can look at building management system logs. Um, we can build digital twins and start to use simulation methods to pull many discrete types of data together into a coherent picture. Next slide, please. A particularly important challenge and one that we go into a little bit uh, uh, in the book chapter, is thinking about the occupant's relationship to interfaces, 
And it could be a simple interface, such as on the left, a light switch. It's either on or it's off. Or it could be, could be a more sophisticated interface, such as uh, a mobile phone app that allows you to turn on and off your appliances remotely. And for each of these, there are both qualitative and quantitative methods that people use to try to uh, uh, inform uh, interface design uh, from the occupant perspective. I won't go into those, but please uh, read about that in the book. Next slide, please. So some final thoughts on this challenge of um, measuring the occupant perspective. Uh, the first is that their uh, implicit is a need to manage a relationship. And this is the relationship between the occupant and the professional. And there are a variety of uh, important but subtle uh, issues that always come up. One is your philosophy of control. Um, is it better to have local versus centralized control? You know, how much do you trust the occupant is another way of framing that one. There are usability issues. Uh, could an occupant ever figure out how to use that thermostat? Is it comprehensible? Is it efficient? Is it effective? Uh, uh, when we measure occupant uh, data, uh, are we measuring uh, the, the right occupants? And you can think there's a, a built-in challenge here. If we're designing a new building, there are no occupants. So where, which building is a good analogy to the one we're going to build? So uh, if we're going to go and measure occupant behavior in some other building, hopefully it applies to the building that we're designing. And um, uh, finally, uh, whose uh, uh, data are we collecting? You know, does the building owner control these data or is it the citizen? And in fact, they're, with the advent of inexpensive uh, air quality sensors, for example, there's a real citizen science movement where uh, occupants are measuring their own data and using that uh, to argue with building owners and operators about what the conditions really are. Uh, with all of these different types of data, it turns out that data reduction strategies are actually an important part of the story. And there are standard statistical ways of doing that, uh, measuring central tendencies or measuring the level of dispersion. But something that we found quite useful is a slightly different approach where we invent personas that represent different ideological types or behavioral clusters or preference profiles and use those to test out a building design. You know, is it suitable for um, uh, grandmother Barbara or for Joe Sixpack? And uh, so in conclusion on this chapter, uh, there are many methods for obtaining the occupant perspective. Uh, the data that they generate is really quite valuable, and doing this is feasible. You can learn how to do this even if you never had training in anthropology or sociology or um, any of the, the social sciences or behavioral sciences. So with that, I'd like to hand it off uh, to the next chapter. Thank you. Back to me. Okay. Um, so the the next chapter is about occupant centric centric performance metrics and performance targets. The idea here um, is that conventionally a lot of our building performance metrics have left occupants out of the picture. Um, so for instance, we talk about uh, energy use intensity, which is energy use divided by the number of square meters or square feet. Um, but this is completely independent of um, occupancy. Uh, and so, for example, it might not credit a very um, well-designed building that accommodates a lot of occupants. So we wanted to um, formalize the idea of occupant-centric metrics, not only because we think it's often a better way of measuring performance, but it also elevates um, the discussion during the design process. And that's kind of a common thread through this book, is at a bare minimum, let's talk about occupants. So. Um, trying to advance. Can someone give me control? There we go. Okay. Um, so as I said, occupant 
centric metrics are all about reframing building performance to be about occupants. Um, and there's several different ways we can do that. Um, probably the most obvious uh, bridging from conventional thinking is to just normalize uh, performance by occupants, whether it's water use, energy use, emissions, material use, etc. cetera. Um, but another form of occupant-centric metrics is to think about exposure of individuals. So instead of um, quantifying the comfort in a space, which may be meaningless if there's no occupants there, um, we can think about the exposure of individuals, um, which would include the dose, let's say a contaminant in the air, um, plus the duration. Um, and this is something we generally don't do, except for in very extreme cases. Um, and you can see in the photo here, Philip has a, um, a meter on his, on his belt that's measuring contamination or contaminant concentration. Um, and so this is a quite a different way of thinking about uh, building performance. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to advance it. The, the critical thing here is that um, until not very long ago, it was difficult to quantify occupancy um, in any sort of detail. And so the, the real enabler of occupant-centric uh, performance metrics is that we can simulate occupants now, um, individuals often, that, that's what the next chapter will cover, uh, but we can also measure occupancy. And so unlike before where um, it's understandable why the focus was on, on very basic metrics like energy use intensity, you can just add up the monthly utility bills, divide by the floor area. Both of those are pretty simple uh, static figures. Um, but with the advent of occupant sensing and, and occupant modeling, we can really um, uh, quantify occupant metrics at a much higher resolution. So this figure here is just showing uh, kind of the workflow to take the information about occupants and other building performance characteristics and then um, outputting these, whether it's through simulation or measurement. Um, and we talked so far about building level, but this can also be done at the, the room level. It can also be done at various um, temporal resolutions. So, um, yeah, as I said, the advent of new technologies means that we can track all of these things in a lot of detail if needed. Um, and in the book, I just wanted to illustrate some of the ways we might do this through the design process um, using a bottom-up approach. So what we're looking at here is the different occupant requirements, whether it's space for, for office space, for a conference room, for parking, um, water, lighting, plug loads, ventilation, comfort, etc. So whereas the conventional way of designing buildings is usually a bit more top down, um, we'd like to advocate for a bottom up approach that thinks about what are the actual needs of the occupants and then um, the next step would be to ensure that the building meets those needs. Um, but, but this sort of approach is, is certainly not conventional. Sorry. And um, one last thing, I think a very useful way to look at occupant-centric metrics is to plot um, building performance, usually simulation, but it could be measured versus occupancy. And in doing so, uh, we can understand a few things, like what is the sensitivity of the building to occupancy, where the right side is, is full occupancy, the left side is vacant. Um, and we can also understand how the building performs when it's empty. Uh, a lot of buildings do not perform very well and, and I think any newcomers to the field would be very surprised. I know the buildings still use a lot of energy typically, even if they're empty. So um, this is a way to track building performance and visualize it and ultimately try to uh, reduce um, the, the height of this, of this curve, be it a straight line or, or a, a nonlinear curve. Great. Um, so I think it brings us to the Q&A and, and the halfway point in the book.
Okay. Um, well, thank you all of you because it was very interesting. It was only a, a, a little piece of, of the book that you have written, but it was extremely interesting. Uh, while I was hearing all of you, um, I have a, a, a question from from us from build up is uh, apparently you are generating an awesome amount of information and uh, how how do you store and treat this information no we are in the in the time of bim for example for for construction to share information platform have you foreseen uh, this information to be shared uh, in any kind of platform or could be reused because some of you seems that also is information very dedicated for sure for the specific occupant but could it be treated or or used by by other similar projects and and how you foreseen this to to work Clarice I wonder if you want to take that one because I think your chapter covers that a bit uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes, um, I think that in chapter three, we sort of try to propose a way to store and catalog this information that is compatible with BIM. The idea is that we somehow record information in context and we have the patterns there as a proposal of how to do that. So uh, that the information is structured and it's not only like loose uh, metrics or things like that, but they, they do form part of a story. And that's what we proposed in chapter three, that we have these patterns of problems and patterns of solutions with then data for simulation to be done and run. And uh, that would be compatible with BIM because it would be object oriented. So the idea of storing and recording information is there. Uh, and then it's just about starting to structure it. And that can either be done uh, on, a, on, on a company by company basis or, you know, some funding potentially for us to start creating a major catalog of information that can then be open source and shareable. Do I answer your question? Absolutely. <laughs> you always do. Uh, we have a question from audience and he said like this, in an occupant centric framework, how is this also applied on an operational building? What are the main challenges technologically wise and are building normally equipped with the proper systems? I believe it could be for uh, Clinton or no, or for Eliam. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can try to take this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm happy for this question because in the case studies, we'll look at a variety of um, buildings and, and technology levels. Um, but in general, I think the question's very apt. Uh, a lot of buildings are not designed with these sorts of systems um, that enable us to you know, track occupants and their behavior. Um, but there's all sorts of creative ways we can do this um, and, and not very, in a not very costly way. Um, so for example, Clint showed um, these survey devices where you can put it on the wall, it's wireless, um, and you can ask people to vote. There's a lot of wearables now um, that don't rely on um, unique hardware. So we have, we can track people and their, their subjective views through um, smartwatches, like what I'm wearing, which was actually part of a study, same with smartphones. Um, we can use cameras and AI, which is an extremely cost-effective way to measure occupancy, especially in public spaces where there are privacy concerns. Um, but then in one of the case studies you'll see later, we use um, plug load meters, so, so receptacle um, power meters to understand a lot about occupants. So it's not necessarily about directly measuring the occupant, but rather using um, proxies. Uh, but of course, with modern uh, building automation systems, we are measuring more and more that is either kind of a direct measurement of occupancy or, or less direct, like CO2 um, or even possibly relative humidity or temperature could be used uh, as a proxy or a partial proxy. Good question. Awesome. I hope Juan that uh, Lion has answered your question. We have another one from audience. It's warming up. 
it says like this, how can we educate occupant to undertake certain behaviors? And do we need a building with a higher, less or less sensitivity to the occupants to make this happen? I, I can try to take it, but I welcome uh, <laughs> my co-authors as well. Um, so, so my first response to this question is, ideally, we don't have to educate people. There is a role for education, but ideally, systems are so obvious and so intuitive that um, people naturally know how to use them. And one of the ways to achieve this is through standardization of, of buildings and interfaces so that um, you don't have to figure out each new building as you go in. And a good example is thermostats and hotel rooms where we're not really used to the system and we, we don't know how to use it. We probably uh, misuse it and abuse it. Um, personally, I think there is a role for making buildings less sensitive to, to occupants in that um, there's a lot of passive features that we we're moving away from in the interest of automation. I think that's probably a mistake. Um, but if we can passively achieve generally comfortable conditions, that should be the, the best solution. Um, because then we're not invoking occupants to, to make you know, fairly extreme measurements, or measures rather. Um, but at some point, we do want occupants to be able to tailor their comfort. Um, and so to, to put people in a box without any adaptive opportunities is surely a mistake. Awesome. Uh, they are, they, the audience is saying that thank you for the questions because they are in the great answers. <laughs> Uh, for uh, for Clinton, um, in the he he has presented the the methods that they can be used, and it seems that there is a need to increase the post occupancy monitoring uh, to have all these desired qualitative data about occupants. How easy is to have this data in private house, housing, for example? I think Clinton had to leave, but maybe there's some. Ah, else. Clinton has to leave. Perhaps yeah. Clarice uh, could answer a little bit here. Uh, yes, I think that the question is a bit complicated because I think it depends on who is the owner. I mean, if if the if the house occupant is the owner, then you can have pretty much whatever control you want and install whatever you want. The problem, I think lies when the occupant is not the owner because then a series of ownership and controls are removed from them and then you have a far more complex situation because at the moment it will depend a lot on what the client wants and how the client wants that building is run and for that to ensure that the occupants have more controls and more degrees of freedom i cannot really foresee much other than some regulation and you know legislation on top of it i'm and, not and sure I'm, if i answer the question but uh, yeah yeah it's it's a it's a broad one <laughs> but yeah. yes and now that i have you there um after hearing all of you do you do you think there is a need of a new profile in the uh, chain of design and construction to take care of the process of occupants to, to make sure that their needs are are for, seen in the design and the construction phase. It's so quite complicated. To address that one. That's a complicated question. <laughs> yeah, uh, but perhaps I, I for think, all of you, but I'm, it seems that that while you are studying, it gets quite complicated. There are a lot of methods and and information and data that have to be uh, processed and. I wonder, do you think there is missing a skill, a specific skill or a specific profile, for example, in this, in the chain that we have now, in the kind of uh, conventional scheme that we have for the design you mean process? Like a role for a consultant or something exactly, like that. Exactly, exactly. Um, I don't know because the truth is that every decision has an impact on the occupant from whatever other professionals that are involved in the design process because ultimately you are designing for somebody to inhabit it so it, it has an ultimate impact in it 
I don't know if adding another layer of responsibility would do the job. I think better it is to find ways to have very clear recording and transferability of information that ensures that all the professionals that are involved in the project are in the same page and can talk about it in a, in a traceable and also transparent way than actually adding another layer. But that's my personal opinion. Awesome. Oh, but Others you have might disagree. In this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so we make up a, a little Q&A session. We continue now with... Um, Next one is uh, Elian again <laughs> uh, with the chapter six, and we will have more questions at the end. Elian, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, so, so the first half of this book was on uh, more fundamental topics and sort of process oriented. The second half uh, gets a little bit more specifically into modeling and simulation, um, and then and then practice. Um, so this is chapter six here. And uh, it focuses on occupant modeling. Um, and, and so in general, why would we model occupants? Lots of reasons. We want to improve performance. As I said, there's this notorious gap, um, which may be a little overstated. Nevertheless, occupants have been attributed as one of the major reasons why we have this gap between measured performance and um, predicted performance. We'd like to that gap. Um, but I think more importantly, we'd like to improve design. So if we have better information during the design process, we can make better decisions. Um, we'd like to account for how building design influences behavior, something that's rarely talked about, but we think is important. Uh, we'd like to understand behavior. For example, how often are people opening windows, closing blinds, etc. Uh, it'd be nice to quantify these sorts of things. Um, and ultimately, as I said before, we want to elevate the discussion of occupants. Um, so the conventional way to model occupants for code compliance or even for the design process when we're using simulation uh, is to treat occupants as this scheduled boundary condition, a little bit like weather. Um, we, we bring in weather files and we sort of expose the building to that. We, we generally conventionally do the same thing with occupants. We expose the building um, to scheduled heat gains um, from occupants. And frankly, it doesn't matter if it's occupants, it could be a light bulb because the impact is the same when it comes down to um, the simulation model. Um, but the limitation of schedules is that it doesn't consider this two-way interaction between um, the building and the people. It also uh, yields the same results. So we know from experience that occupants have some uncertainty associated with them. Um, and every day or every building might be different depending on who occupies the building and what their preferences and habits are. Um, so we'd like to, in more advanced occupant modeling, bring in this uncertainty so that, for example, instead of predicting a single performance level, we can predict a range of performance levels. Um, so just some, some basic terminology, whereas before we, we treated uh, occupants as a schedule, with very fixed assumptions. Um, in the realm of more advanced modeling, um, we recognize that there's going to be certain conditions, noise, temperature, um, uh, air contaminants, et cetera. And these may trigger occupants to take an action. There may also be what we call non-adaptive triggers, things like uh, scheduled meetings or activities like cooking, cleaning, um, turning on a computer, et cetera. Either way, these, um, these triggers are affected by what we call contextual factors. These are things like the presence of other occupants, um, corporate um, dress codes, all sorts of things that are sort of a bit uh, more qualitative that might influence behavior. Uh, ultimately, the occupant may take some action, like uh, turning on a light or opening a window, and um, the action influenced the state of the system. For example, the light is on or the window is open. And so this is the sort of terminology we talk about. Um, the last thing is occupancy, which by this we mean the presence of occupants or the number of occupants. Um, whereas behavior is all about the things that the occupants do. Um, 
some of the traits we'd like to cover with these more advanced models, we'd like them to be stochastic, in other words, random, so that we can predict ranges of performance. Um, we'd like them to be two-way so that um, the models actually are affected by conditions and, and building design. And lastly, we'd like them to be data-driven or evidence-based um, so that instead of making up reasonable assumptions or what we think might be reasonable assumptions, these are actually based on um, measured data, uh, which is really important and, and a pretty big step forward in terms of design practice. And then we'd like to be able to model everything from uh, occupancy, so presence, mobility, maybe movement between spaces or between in the building and out, um, use of major energy consuming equipment, um, all those passive systems that, that greatly influence energy and comfort like doors, windows, blinds, um, and also thermostat adjustment. Um, so the field and, and what we cover in the book, the, the field has largely gone towards one sort of um, uh, occupant modeling, which is a, a Markov chain, um, where it essentially says, how likely is someone to act in the next time step according to current conditions? Um, in this case, we have an example of the probability of opening a window based on uh, room temperature and carbon dioxide uh, concentration indoors. Um, so the sort of so-called memoryless uh, model just looks at what is the probability that someone acts in the next time step. Um, and then in the simulation, the, there's a random number generated and, and we decide whether in fact the occupant does or does not act. But this is just one type of model um, that we cover in, in the book. Um, so on sort of the other end of the spectrum, a little bit more qualitative, we also look at uh, personas, which is a, a concept that's been developed in other fields, but not so much in buildings. And we think it has a lot of promise. The idea is to develop certain personalities that are not necessarily statistically representative of the population that will occupy a building, but at least this can give us a sense of the sorts of people that will occupy a building so that we can um, humanize the design process a little bit and think about what are the actual needs and habits um, and experiences of a few individual occupants so that at least we're designing for humans and not for um, purely technical specifications. Um, so with that, I'll be happy to pass it off to my colleague, Isabella. Thank you so much, Liam. Yeah, you can all see me. So um, we just saw that there are several ways really of approaching occupant behavior modeling. And in this chapter, which is chapter seven, we will see which occupant modeling approach is actually the most suitable for the simulation case at hand. I co-wrote this chapter with my colleagues, um, a lot of colleagues actually, Erdo Madavi, Christiane, who you met earlier, Professor Jan Hansen and Professor Peter Jan Oes from TOE in Eindhoven. So um, the first, very first point of fit for purpose um, rationale is really that the occupant modeling approach should depend on the purpose of the simulation, on your building, on your KPI, on the granularity of the KPI and so on. And we like to approach this in a sort of bidimensional matrix, which looks at occupant behavior uncertainty, how uncertain you are about the various aspects of occupant behavior for a simulation case, and occupant behavior impact. So how important really are the various aspects of occupant behavior for your simulation and for the KPI that you're looking for? So the whole idea being that if you have very low impact, so actually the occupant behavior is like rather you know, not influential for your results, then you should definitely use the lowest model complexity, so the simplest model that you have at hand. Whereas if your expected impact is high, then depending on the uncertainty level, you should either use, you know, your available knowledge if you have low uncertainty, or there is the top right quadrant here where you should actually investigate the model complexity. So how, what do we actually mean by model complexity? So we've seen a couple of approaches earlier in chapter six, but the whole idea here is really that 
the more we increase the complexity of our models, the more we reduce the abstraction error. And I put here on the top like two examples of you know a very simple model of a face. And you have obviously you know you're you're modeling a face in this case, and here you have a very very simple model of a face. So it's a very strong abstraction. And here you have a much more refined model of a face. So obviously the abstraction error really goes down the moment your models are more complex. At the same time, your uncertainty in the inputs, depending on which life cycle um, stage you are of your building, may really go up. So going back to the simple example on the top, if you're really you know, um, expecting to produce a model of a face with a very simple kind of dot, the only thing that might go wrong is probably the radius of the dot, but still it will be very similar to your intended um, you know, objective. Whereas if you're trying to really model, you know, um, this person and this person has like short hair and blonde and smiling and so on and so on. But actually you're not like completely certain of these input parameters and the way you have to communicate them to your computer and to your machine, then the result might be really completely different than what you originally expected. This example is possibly even more controversial now than it was um, when I first developed it. The whole point of being uh, of this being that we are aiming to reduce the prediction error, so overall the overall prediction error, and really minimize that. And this is what we call fit for purpose model. At the same time, assessing the impact of occupant behavior is actually not as easy as it sounds. So we really, you know, there is kind of macro categories that we all understand. For example, we all know, you know, what skin loan dominated buildings are and what internal load dominated buildings are. And we could say, you know, skin load dominated buildings are much more likely to be, you know, influence, influence like their energy performance in this case, it's much more likely to be influenced by whatever happens at the facade. So by the interaction of people with blinds or with windows. Conversely, if you have an internal load dominated building, then it's much more likely to be influenced by, you know, people's presence, how they turn on and off the lights or like the use of plug loads and so on. So I used to make the example, you know, if you turn on a light in, let's say, a greenhouse, then obviously you have much less impact than if you do so in a bunker. But the reality is that buildings are way more complex than this. And then we have this in-between area, which is kind of where most buildings actually sit. So for that, we really needed a simulation approach to be based our strategy on and to really reach fit for purpose modeling. I don't have time today to go in detail you know, of every single step, but basically what you see, it's kind of a cascade of different steps. And these steps, again, like start with the simplest possible step um, and operation to really go towards more and more complex. And we'll go in a couple of the steps now in a second, and I'll give you an example of those. So again, I developed this strategy um, you know, using Energy Plus as a building simulation software and MATLAB as a processing tool, but it can be applied to any building simulation software or processing tool. So the second step, well, the first step, you, yeah, you can basically, you will find in the chapter, the impact in this method, I will not go into detail today, but it's really based on the heat balance of your building. And so it's really a first screening test in order to understand a little bit, as we showed earlier, with the skin load dominated, internal load dominated, which kind of macro category your building is. The diversity patterns, however, which is the second step, step, um, step um, shows all the possible combinations of high and low variations of uncertain occupant behavior aspects. What does this mean? This is, for example, you know, you, you may expect your building to be occupied between, let's say, peak 50% and 80%, but you're not really sure about that. So the point here is basically modeling both, some high and low variations and all the possible combinations with the various different aspects of occupant behavior. So presence together with you know, plug loads, um, the response of people towards opening the windows, changing the thermostat and so on. So the moment you do that, you basically see your value, your result of the simulation changing from one single value, which was you know, the typical um, result you obtained when you had your deterministic and scheduled models, moving towards a range of values, as we'll see in a second. 
And then we implemented the Man Whitney U test in order to really understand which of these aspects of occupant behavior that are uncertain actually had an importance for the spread, so caused the majority of the spread. So to give you an example of what this really mean, um, means, I, uh, we developed here 16 building variations. So these are all different buildings. And we were looking at the cooling energy use. In this case, so we applied the diversity patterns and you see that instead of having one single dot for each of the buildings, we have a spread of values. In the case of building one, for example, this spread goes from about 10 to about 70 kilowatt hours per meter square per year. But the spread you see is very different across the different buildings, which means basically that the influence of the various aspects of occupant behavior really changes. Some buildings are more sensitive to occupant behavior and other buildings are less sensitive to it. So when we implemented the Man Whitney U test, we could see that actually the spread for building one in particular was largely imputable to the way that people used the lights and not really regarding the windows or the blind use. And so going to the next step, the idea here is to refine the occupant behavior modeling approach for that aspect of occupant behavior or those aspects um, that really have a stronger effect on the results. So as we saw, for example, in the Madrid U test earlier, we found out that the spread was really imputable majority to the light use. And we'll see what happens when we refine the modeling for that specific occupant behavior aspect. What I wanted to point out here as well is that after each of the steps of this strategy, you really like basically are asked whether you can make a decision based on the results. And if you can, that's basically your fit for purpose occupant behavior model. And only if you cannot, then you're led to the next step. This all gets, um, you know, might sound a little bit abstract, but the moment you see the chapter, it will be very tangible, hopefully. So what happens when we implement then more refined, in this case with stochastic models, to those aspects that were considered influential? So we saw that there was a spread initially of potential cooling energy use, so the performance of this particular building was uncertain and had quite, you know, a big uncertainty between 10 and 70 kilowatt hours per meter square per year. If we refine the modeling approach for the lighting use, we see that this spread really gets reduced quite a lot. So it really has the strongest impact on the result. If we refine the modeling instead for the blind use or for the windows use, which did not happen to be extremely influential, then we see that there is almost no um, impact at all in the results. And you see here also all possible combinations. So this is just to kind of whet your appetite about you know, how you can approach this seemingly very complex problem. And we hope that you'll find your solutions in chapter seven. So I'll pass the word to my colleague Farhan from University College London. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Izo. Uh, yes, this is Farhan Kamosebi, and uh, on behalf of uh, the team of authors, I introduce you to our next chapter on uh, simulation methods for occupant-centric design. Yeah, following uh, what Liam as uh, Isabella just introduced with regard to modeling occupants and uh, fit for purpose occupant models, uh, we started this chapter by discussing four fundamental ways in which occupant models can be integrated uh, into the simulation aided design process. In the simplest form, uh, namely using the stochastic occupant models as fixed design parameters, uh, we utilize building simulation tools uh, uh, to computationally inform or let's say optimize the design of building form, its materiality uh, or systems, uh, but uh, not its occupants. And uh, besides, we don't consider the human building interactions. So regardless what design solution we end up with, uh, occupants are assumed uh, to be the same and behave the same as the initial assumptions. 
uh, but if we make use of dynamic occupant models in this process, uh, we will better capture what will eventually happen in the actual building as we cover the interactions between occupants and building systems. And thus, uh, we may end up with a different design solutions and reach a better design performance. As an example here, if you design, let's say, a very large west-facing window, uh, you may not gain more sunlight because the occupants uh, will be more likely to close the shades to avoid the glare. Uh, in another scenario, we can indeed also subject occupants uh, and their behavior patterns to the iterative design process. Uh, for example, to investigate the impact of uh, different, different levels of uh, occupancy or occupancy scenarios. And finally, using dynamic occupant models as design variables, uh, we can examine how different types of occupants, for example, in terms of their uh, readiness to adjust the environment, yield uh, different design solutions, uh, for example, best suitable uh, for people with the specific needs. And bringing uh, all this into practice, we then discuss in the chapter different simulation aided design methods, including uncertainty and sensitivity analysis, parametric design and optimizations, and the possibilities to include uh, occupants and occupant behavior models in these processes. And these brought us to specific simulation aided design objectives, including performance compliant design, robust design, occupant adaptive and resilient design. And uh, how we can pursue these objectives in an occupant centric design process. And finally, sorry. And finally, we examined a few of these processes in a, on a simple test bit, which, uh, as you can see here, uh, included a parametric definition of facade elements, uh, but also included two types of occupant behavior models, uh, one covering uh, the standard practice and the other one including dynamic occupant behavior models. For example, replacing the standard based uh, schedules by sampling uh, arrival and departure times for each occupant in the model in, on each day. And uh, to show you just one example from these tests, uh, I show you briefly the results of the robust design optimization uh, led by my colleague uh, Mohamed Ouf from Concordia University, uh, where we could verify that our optimized design can bring occupant to less frequent instances of closing the shades and also less use of electrical lighting. And this was something that we could only achieve by the use of uh, dynamic occupant models in the computational design support platform that we set up. And yes, this was chapter eight, very briefly. I hope it tempted you to uh, get the book and read the chapter. And now I'm happy to hand over to Philip. Great. Thanks, Rang. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so chapter nine uh, is about building interfaces, design, and considerations for simulation. My name is Philip Agee. I'm from Virginia Tech. Just like to acknowledge uh, the co-authors of this chapter, Julia and, and Liam, Tariq, Amir, and Clinton. This is a nice collaborative effort, and we're happy to uh, share some of the work with you today. Okay, so building the building interfaces, um, what and why? So building interfaces are simply uh, where intentional and un unintentional interactions occur between the human and the building, their subsystems, right? And the reason why we care about this is these occupants have these interactions uh, 
with interfaces and the frequency and variety of these interactions both impact human performance in the built environment and outcomes in the buildings. And so if you think about an example of a lighting control or a thermostat or even a toilet, they all have different impacts on the building, but they also, um, we also interact with those interfaces at different frequencies, even different frequencies during the time of the year, right? And uh, one point we wanted to make that you've, you've heard kind of emerge from other uh, discussions this morning is, you know, the context of the occupant in the type of building matters. So we had definitely have, we definitely see different approaches um, as far as the level of control or design for control in residential versus, say, a commercial building thermostat where really the thermostat is serving the purpose of collecting a dry bulb temperature and reporting it back to a BAS system. There's really no intent for an occupant to ever interact with that thermostat. So in that case, the thermostat is almost serving as a sensor as more than an interface for the occupant to interact. From a human factors perspective, most of our building interfaces today are uh, designed for the visual sensory system. And if there's any interaction, a lot of times there's a, a visual sensory component with a haptic response. So pushing a button, turning a wheel, um, but increasingly, and for something for uh, other smart folks, maybe on the call to think about from a sim simulation integration is as we add modalities of interaction, um, meaning as we add auditory interfaces, um, you know, or combine auditory and visual interfaces, right? That adds complexity to uh, our current capacity for simulation. So in the context of building performance simulation, you know, the human building interface interactions are, are a gap that we're all working towards and we understand how, how important they are through the work from the annex and through this book. Um, but this is just a really simple view of an actual simulator view of integrating a programmable thermostat into uh, the building performance simulation, which, you know, leads to uh, a more energy efficient building from an output standpoint from the simulation. But the way that the simulator output looks at it from a simple uh, setback and set point temperature perspective. And then obviously the actual thermostat view from the user, which is much different than the way that the simulator looks at the programmable thermostat. And again, as you add more modalities, right, as we move uh, the thermostat from just being a fixed uh, visual display on the wall to having the ability to control the thermostat with our phone, maybe even remotely from out of the building, now that level of complexity, um, you know, has not been necessarily taken into account in our current uh, kind of state of, uh, state of the art in terms of building performance simulations. So I just wanted to speak a little bit about automation, right? Because it, you're going to hear a little bit about it too um, coming up in, in subsequent chapters. But right now, uh, the current view of building automation is definitely technology centered and, and over oversimplified, right? A lot of times we talk about it as is a as a function in a system automated or not automated. And really, it, it's it's it may be more helpful to think about automation in terms of a continuum, right? We we think about it actually in relationship to human system interactions. Um, and they can be more human dominated in that in that interaction, or they can be more uh, tech, excuse me, technology dominated on the right side of this function allocation model. So in other kind of contexts like aerospace or transportation, we think about automation in terms of supporting human performance. And the current view in buildings, we have a tendency to do what's called a leftover approach to function allocation. So we just simply assign the human in the building what's left over from what the technology can do. And we just show here in chapter nine, this kind of applied model of a function allocation for thermostats, where on the left side, you see these kind of uh, human dominant, which are more manual type thermostats, all the way towards the more technology dominant, where we might be introducing some type of a learning thermostat, or maybe even a thermostat that's integrated with demand side management, right, where you have other um, stakeholders involved in the control of the building. So we do have, uh, we did provide a, an adapted framework for the design of interface, building interfaces and evaluation, understanding that interfaces are a very broad topic, right? We could, we could talk about interfaces in the context of wayfinding in a building, um, you know, entry egress into the building, thermostats, lighting controls, plumbing controls, right? So it's, it's a broad topic, but we do have, um, there is an ISO standard for the ergonomics of human system interaction, and we just effectively adapted that framework um, to help practitioners, designers think about designing more occupant-centric 
uh, building interfaces. But you know, as some of us might have talked about offline or in our annex discussions, you know, this is really the an antithesis of the way that building controls are currently designed uh, in, in our industry. <clears throat> so, in summary. Uh, about chapter nine, you know, building interfaces, designing considerations for simulation. We have a lot of work to do, right? We're just, we think we've just kind of, kind of uh, starting in this space, but, you know, we understand that humans interact with buildings and their subsystems, and these interactions matter, and, and they, they matter from a building performance standpoint, they matter from a, a human performance standpoint, and these, the current interfaces are really predominantly visual haptic interactions and right now we're, we're faced with a lack of standards around building interfaces not just you know things like icons and the task interaction relationships probably need to be uh standardized if we're really to kind of integrate them into simulations in a in a way that we feel confident about what they're actually predicting and then right now we just currently don't accurately re reflect the complexity of the interactions and so as we know we're adding more modalities like a phone or uh, auditory interactions that that complexity and certainty is is something that we'll have to overcome and so with that thanks for your attention on chapter nine and i'm happy to turn it over to my colleague rock thank you philip um so we are now over to chapter 10 um, so I'll be talking about the design of sequences of operation uh, for occupant-centric controls. Um, so um, that is, um, sorry, I don't know why it's not moving. So design of sequences of operations is actually a, a design phase that is often overlooked by many design professionals. It's, it's usually rushed and, um, uh, and improperly implemented into building automation systems. But ultimately, it's one of the most influential design phases. In the end, it's the design phase that details which component runs at what st uh, stage and what set points and what schedules should be used in in in, in operation um, and ultimately when it's implemented um, occupant centric uh, occupant sensing technologies can be inappropriately selected and occupant data may not be uh, optimally used so this sec uh, this chapter aims to provide guidance on um, these aspects basically um, so um, so the chapter structure essentially goes through introducing what occupant centric controls mean as part of the design um, phase of sequences of operation design uh, and controls oriented occupant data uh, in essentially what grades of occupant data are there uh, the you know most promising current sensing technologies enabling that kind of occupant data. Um, what are um, occupant centric control variables that you know database variables in in a in a controller um, that needs to be defined and examples of um, um, sequences of operation um, using occupant centric control variables. And ultimately, we also talked about integration of OCC uh, in the building performance-based, uh, building performance simulation-based design process, and the potential energy savings potential through using occupant-centric controls. Um, so the the chapter starts off by introducing this um, controls-oriented occupant data. Um, grid um, essentially from um, building resolution to zone resolution there's obviously an increasing special uh, resolution there's also uh, occupant data as simple as detecting the presence and absence of uh, the people in the room or their count or what to to the resolution of their activities and what they do and, uh, essentially so so here we actually gave a few examples of various technologies that may enable us uh, to acquire occupant information that resolution um, that 
uh, includes things like motion detectors and CO2 sensors um, or Wi-Fi based device count um, sensors or people counting cameras um, or uh, to monitor occupant activities or, or you know acquire occupant activity data uh, we may look into to um, thermostat interactions and, and window contact sensors um, and, and many other things obviously but these are just examples um, so ultimately through that uh, through the occupant data we can actually calculate certain OCC variables so these are controller variables that that needs to be calculated and stored as analog variables inside a building automation system um, so that may be things like you know the earliest expected arrival time to a zone or the latest expected departure time to a zone so that variable will be different for each zone naturally and, or, or uh, preferred temperature and illuminance levels in, in a zone so instead of having a blanket set point and schedule for every single zone in a building uh, what's being suggested here is actually you know tailoring individual set points and schedules for individual zones for uh, for individual sections of a building um, uh, and, and i'll try to give a few examples of what that means and what the significance of that is so um, for example just you know on this graph you'll see two examples of you know the earliest arrival time and the latest departure times two control variables uh, in a, in a in an actual building and this is pre covid um so and one thing that you'll notice that there's a big variance uh day to day variation in the in the occupancy profiles but um trying the what this example actually tries to illustrate is is that um it, trying to find a, a common start time and a common stop time for uh for a commercial building has, gets very difficult um, because everyone's schedules are somewhat different and that extends the operating hours and that's kind of the motivation behind why uh, we need zone level occupancy uh, OCCs. So just as an example for um, here you can see some zones in a building uh, so you, you see two metrics uh, so the latest arrival times in a building and the ratio of absent days in a building. Uh, and again, these are uh, data from 30 something occupants uh, pre-COVID in an office, academic office building. Um, so even before COVID on average, one in every four days, uh, people were absent from their offices. And, and, and we know that they, uh, their latest arrival times is around 11 or noon uh, so so a, a simple sequence of operation could just simply be um, if a motion detector in the uh, motion detector in a room hasn't been triggered until noon uh, the space will likely remain empty for the rest of the day so why don't we just revert the zone back to the unoccupied mode and apply a temperature setback until the rest of the day instead of conditioning that space so simple things like that um, uh, here in this case and uh, um, another simple logic that that could be applied so on many days uh, we see that occupants um, drop in for brief periods I mean just for meetings pick up the uh, or or a delivery um, so if a motion detector in a room hasn't been triggered for longer than for several hours let's say you know three four hours the the uh, a simple logic could simply again revert the zone back into the unoccupied mode um, and in this chapter we also talked about um, uh, how we can incorporate occupant centric controls in the building performance simulation based design process because some of these variables some of these logic can get complex and and we often want to make sure that the 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 sequences of operation um make sense for the for the individual building that we're looking at 
So in this case, we introduced two different ways of uh, incorporating OCC uh, into um, the simulation base uh, uh, design process. One of them is um, one of them uses um, you know directly incorporating uh, the the variables inside the energy management system of the building simulation tool Energy Plus, and the other one is more like a coupling, much like what is uh, presented in her chapter. Um, so through interactions with external um, um, programming environments like R or Python or MATLAB and so on. Uh, we also talked about the energy savings potential by implementing occupant-centric controls as opposed to um, like traditional business as usual way of operating. Um, so this kind of in indicates uh, different bundles of OCC solutions that can be incorporated and the savings that we can anticipate. Um, so by simply, for example, um, 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 implementing um, basically a demand control ventilation, we can anticipate about a 10% reduction in this, you know, simulation exercise on average. Uh, but if you actually keep adding more complexities um, and high resolution of occupant sensing and better sequences of operation, the savings that we can anticipate acquiring can be as high as 35% based on this simulation-based uh, investigation. So, so I'll pass it over to Tarek, or Liam, actually. Yep, I'll pass it over to me. Thanks, Barak. Um, so I'm sitting in for Tarek. And um, the last main chapter of this book is about um, case studies. And I'm really proud of these case studies because they're not sort of passive reporting of uh, building performance, but they're very much uh, where the researcher or researchers were actively involved in the case study. They're in the loop, they were interacting either with occupants or with the owner or the design team or the operators or so on. Um, so these are really excellent case studies that um, allowed us to demonstrate some of the challenges and opportunities associated with um, implementing the methods that we talk about through the, the first part of the book. Um, so I'll skip right in. Um, so these are the seven case studies, and uh, I'd like to thank all the authors and building owners and, and other parties involved in these case studies because they were a lot of effort. You can see the case studies are pretty diverse, at least in terms of um, climate. And um, they're also diverse in terms of spatial scale. So some are looking at uh, the room level, others are looking at the building scale and some in between. Um, and then they also look at different phases of the building life cycle. So some focus at the beginning, whereas um, others look at operations. So the building was built, but we sort of retrospectively look at the design and the operation. Um, so I'll quickly go through, but but uh, obviously, you know, roughly one minute per case study will not do them justice. But uh, hopefully, this whets your appetite and entices you to read our um, free book. Um, so the first case study was in Toronto, Canada, focused on the design phase, um, and this was led by by Tarek Abunera, who, um, among other things, interviewed key um, uh, parties that were modeling the building because um, he wanted to understand what the discussion was about occupants how are the designers the architect the energy modeler the mechanical engineers how are they talking about occupants um, and his conclusion was that there was very little discussion between these um, different professionals about occupants um, and just one result of that that illustrates the point is that he looked at um, the, the assumptions that went into each of these professionals' energy models, and he found they varied by a factor of two. Now, unsurprisingly, certain uh, professionals are motivated or kind of biased um, to be conservative, like the mechanical engineer will typically assume a lot of internal gains, 
to avoid the risk of undersizing the air conditioning system. But nevertheless, the, this illustrated a, a lack of coordination. Um, to the credit of these professionals, there's a lot of uncertainty. This was a speculative building. Um, but nevertheless, we felt that they, they could have interacted a little bit more about occupants. Uh, the next case study is a, a really interesting one. They all are. Um, this is in Budapest. And um, the goal here was to design a co-living space uh, with a lot of shared facilities. So shared kitchens and common spaces and then um, 27 different uh, apartments. The novelty here was that they used participatory design. And so there were numerous meetings involving 16 different people who were expected to live here ultimately um, where they talked about everything from um, needs space needs you know are, are they satisfied with sharing a kitchen or common spaces um, but also very specific things related to energy because the goal was to come up with reasonable schedules um, that reflected the actual expected occupants um, in order to come up with more accurate energy predictions um, and among other things, they discovered that in this case, the ASHRAE schedule for homes pretty uh, well resembled what they learned from the occupants having interviewed them. Um, so this again is a, a really neat case study um, and it really embodies the, the values we're trying to promote, which is to bring occupants into the design process. The next one, um, so whereas the previous one was during design, this one is uh, post-occupancy, although the uh, researchers were involved in the design of the building, I believe. Uh, but this is a 40-unit social housing building in Quebec City, which is one of the colder climates we studied. Um, and what's neat about this building is that the researchers have access to a tremendous amount of data, probably more than I've ever seen for any residential building. They're tracking water use, hot water, uh, energy use, virtually every behavior that affects energy like windows, blinds, doors, occupancy, um, appliance use, etc. So a very high resolution of measurement. Um, a, a few of the key findings from this study was that um, between the lowest energy user and the highest um, apartment, vary by a factor of about 12, um, which is consistent with what any researcher in this field would know, uh, but very surprising to designers who, especially if you're using very standardized assumptions about occupants, you might not recognize that this level of variability is possible. Interestingly, um, in this cold climate, this, this building worked so hard on um, improving the envelope that the heating load was actually relatively small, less than 20% of the, the energy use compared to something like 60 for the average Canadian um, apartment building. Um, but what was left, the plug load, so the, the appliances, lighting, and the hot water especially made up a huge portion of the end use. Um, but of course, occupants can play a big role in those things, um, probably more than heating. Um, so it turned out this building was very sensitive to occupant behavior. The next one, oops, excuse me. Um, this is the first um, timber frame passive house in um, the Southern Hemisphere. This is a, a university residence building. Um, and the goal for this uh, case study was to compare um, simulation assumptions to actual usage. Um, and just to give a, a highlight, probably the most profound finding was that um, the tool used for this building, and if you're designing a passive house, you're sort of forced to use one tool for, for verification and design. Um, it assumed 100% occupancy, whereas they found um, the measured occupancy was closer to 50%. Um, and it was also very seasonal, just given the nature of the, the university residence building. Um, they also found overheating was a major problem that was unanticipated during design. The fifth out of seven case studies, um, this one looked at a very different scale. So this is um, at Stanford in Redwood City, 
uh, US. And um, Andrew and his colleagues wanted to understand how people were um, using their, their cubicles or their workstations in this office building. Um, and he did so in a fairly um, indirect way. He measured um, the computer energy use at every single workstation. And his goal was to um, figure out things like how, how diverse are the schedules and how are people interacting? Um, because he discovered that if you look at computer use and just the, the power use, you can figure out likely which sorts of which people are interacting with each other, which people are taking lunch breaks at the same time, just by recording longitudinal um, high resolution data. He also used uh, these information to look at scenarios where um, they could consolidate the, the desks such that um, they were not heating or cooling or, or lighting certain parts of the building just because of the, the uses patterns. Of course, this was a pre-COVID study, um, so there may be additional concerns about uh, distancing and so on. Nevertheless, a very innovative uh, application for plug use data. The next building in Luxembourg, again, a, a very different scale. They looked at um, a narrow topic, which is window shading controls. Um, and so this building was already built during the study, but they looked at how people were using window shades, um, how frequently they were interacting, et cetera. And what they found con in contrast to much of the literature, actually the, the interaction with the blinds was fairly minimal. And this may be because it's a sort of semi-open plan office and people are reluctant to uh, annoy others. Um, but the authors speculate that the controls uh, that were originally configured were actually quite good, and so it didn't necessitate a lot of overrides. And the last one in Sweden um, was a retrofit project. So again, a very different case study. Um, the purpose of the retrofit was to improve energy performance and comfort. Um, and the authors and researchers did a lot of different um, studies to understand the occupant satisfaction. They did interviews, they did um, surveys, they had a smartphone app that they helped develop uh, to collect information from the occupants. Um, and in general, they found that the occupants were fairly satisfied with um, daylighting and ventilation, not quite as satisfied with the temperature. Um, so that brings us to the end of the book. And I'd just like to acknowledge once again, all of the contributors um, and, and the project at large and X79, without whom this book would not be possible. I'm very proud of the results. And uh, thanks also to Farhang, my co-editor. Um, and I just wanted to note, because we didn't explicitly mention it, this book is open access. Is in we paid to publish it, which means it's free to the world, which is important to us because we'd like to ensure that um, this book is accessible to um, people making the world a better place. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liam, and to all the presenters. Uh, we are looking forward to read it now, in fact. So uh, first thing, I would like to remember the audience that they can send us the questions for the speakers through the platform, and we will read it on time. We have already some questions, uh, so let's begin with the last presentations. So um, I, we have one for uh, Isabella. It says like this, uh, what should be the standard reaction time between the detection of occupants need and its satisfaction? And it comments, uh, normally buildings have a certain inertia reacting, for example, heating system. Thank you so much for the question. So um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a little bit open to answer in the sense, you know, standard reaction time to satisfy needs. You know, there can be many, many various needs and many different reaction times. Um, what we see happening more and more um, also, you know, as part of my consulting work is that people are more and more interested in having really granular controls, especially when it comes to, you know, like lighting levels, temperature levels, and so on. So, um, which obviously poses, you know, quite some challenges in the simulation kind of aspect of things. 
Um, but again, you know, the, the answer to which would be the standard reaction time is as, as fast as possible. Um, at the same time, you know, what we also found is that people actually are quite up for, you know, compromising to some extent on their freedom and comfort if really given an explanation of, you know, why they should be doing that. And like, you know, them accepting, you know, one or two degrees more or less, um, what what's the impact on the energy performance of that and why should, they should be doing that. So I think um, <clears throat> kind of my take on this is, you know, we we buy iPhones and whatever, and we have like thousands of instructions on how to use them and so on. Whereas we all inhabit buildings and nobody sort of tells them, uh, tells us what our role, um, you know, to contribute to the building concept really is. So I think I'm not saying we need instruction for buildings, but a little bit more of involvement of people and a little bit more on guidance on really, you know, what is the impact that we can have on building performance. I think that would be very, very welcome. So yeah, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Isabella. Let's go to Liam uh, in the chapter six. Um, it says like this, schedules are obviously widely used to define occupants in simulation tools. While they have their limits, they also have lots of benefits. How might we adopt schedules to address some of their limitations? That's a good question. I think I planted that question, but anyway. Uh, so um, I, I don't think schedules are going away. All the, the building simulation tools and the building codes um, effectively mandate them. Um, but there are a few ways to, to adopt them to be a little bit more advanced. And, and one of them is to um, have different schedules for different um, design features. So for example, um, we could have different lighting schedules for different building orientations, for example. We have a paper on that. Um, but maybe in more basic, we could mandate in, in building codes that um, several different schedules are used and then the um, the building owner would be forced to declare the, the best or the worst result of that. Um, and in that way, um, there would be sort of a, a bigger range of different occupancy scenarios included. And um, there would be some incentive to make sure that our buildings work well for lots of different um, occupant behaviors or occupancy levels. Thank you very much, Liam. For Farhan in uh, chapter eight, uh, it says like this, what training or tool upgrades should be implemented to better incorporate advanced occupant models? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, I would start by the tools upgrade and uh, touch on some of the limitations that we have currently in the simulation tools. and. Uh, one is actually the fact that uh, mainly simulation tools do not offer a wide range of usage scenarios or schedules. So you are at times quite limited, uh, especially with uh, freely available tools. And uh, likewise, uh, they mostly do not uh, include existing occupant beha uh, behavior models, which are rather established in the literature. Uh, but it's not as easy as going into the tool and, for example, look for window operation behavior and have a drop down menu and pick some from uh, the literature and even reference to the research. No, it is not like that, unfortunately, yet. Uh, also, the other issue with the tools uh, is that uh, uh, regardless of the occupant's presence, uh, normally occupants are not defined explicitly and in one place. Uh, rather, you need to go through different devices, for example, windows and lights and thermostats or different uh, strategies such as ventilation and so on to find things that are actually might be related to occupants, such as opening or closing windows and so on. Uh, this again makes the uh, consideration uh, of occupants in the building uh, design and analysis uh, less straightforward and far from ideal. And uh, finally, I would say uh, the simulation tools normally directly do not allow for uh, 
definition and inclusion of uh, probabilistic or stochastic occupant behavior models, uh, which is a feature that is may mostly needed because uh, occupant uh, actions are normally uh, activated based on probabilities driven from uh, observed data. And uh, that actually brings me to the skill that uh, users need still, and that's uh, programming and data analysis on top of the simulation tools. So currently, normally, if a researcher, a student, or practitioner wants to try more advanced occupant models, there's some level of programming and data analysis is needed. Either it is internal to the simulation tools, uh, such as uh, what Energy Plus offers as uh, uh, Energy Plus run, uh, runtime language. Uh, so internally, you would develop this uh, runtime data exchange and. Uh, definition of occupant behavior models, or you go for external uh, coupling such as using MATLAB or Python or external tools such as OBFMU uh, developed by LVNL, for example. So in summary, the tools still can be improved. And currently, for more advanced uh, models of occupant behavior, uh, you would need uh, some experience in programming and data analysis. Thank you very much, Farhan. Uh, well, it's uh, if somebody of the other speakers wants to also propose over the questions, please uh, jump in. Um, we have one for Philip um, when he was talking about chapter nine. It says like these building interfaces clearly have shortcomings. What is the single most important research priority to improve the status quo? Yeah, so it's thanks for the question. Um, I think always be wary of these. I think answering a complex systems problem with a single answer, right? So I'm going to go ahead and possibly say that my answer might not satisfy the, the original question. But yeah, I think what we're seeing is just a lack of standardization, right? So one of some work we're, we're, we're carrying on through the annex is looking at uh, the ways of uh, icon standardization and we looked at 58 thermostats um, and you know the primary task of a thermostat from a human perspective is to adjust the set point temperature right and of the 58 thermostats we saw 29 different ways to actually adjust the thermostat um, the set point temperature so to summarize you know it's hard you know it's a systems problem so single answers are, are typically not satisfactory for complex systems problem, but if I was to start somewhere, it would be with um, ICON standardization. Okay, thank you so much, Philip. <laughs> um, let's go to Budak. Um, when he was presenting this chapter 10, it reads like this, occupant-centric controls aims to increase building automatization to ultimately improve comfort and save energy. However, OCC strategies tend to take control away from occupants. Is there a risk that the reduction in real or per uh, perceived controls leads to greater dissatisfaction? You don't take away control, um, so... Um, the, I, I understand there's always a challenge between like uh, balancing the automation and manual control. Um, but uh, basically what I meant uh, is um, like there will be a role for automation and and the automation uh, and there will be a role for manual controls uh, always. Um, what I'm what we meant, here is, is essentially putting more emphasis on um, understanding what the occupants need in the automation part of things. Um, so like the, the the easiest way to think about this is, is that um, the uh, building schedules uh, or zone, zone schedules, um, that's not going to be manually controlled um, or or the default temperature set points. So, so um, things like that, they could be tuned for individual preferences. And and then if an occupant wants to make an override to these uh, default values, they're, they're all, they should be always welcome to do so. So by no means OCC should take away control in my view. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Burak. And I must say that uh, from the build-up part, when you propose the energy saving potential of occupant-centric controls, we are really interested in that. So we will we will really follow up uh, sure. your chapter. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, let's go to back, go back to chapter two with Christiana. Um, and we have a question saying, how should we address trade-offs between different domains of IEQ uh, during the design process? For example, how should we solve a solution where a particular design decision improves uh, internal air quality at the cost of noise? I don't know if Christina is continue to be with us. Yes, hi. Hi, I hope you can hi, hear hi. me. Yes, we hear you perfectly, okay. thank you. Perfect, <laughs> just got an error message. Yeah, thank you so much for, for the question. Yeah, indeed, um, as I mentioned, that's, that's uh, yeah, some of the parts that really still need some, some ongoing work. So I also know from, from some colleagues who are currently working on, on multi-domain comfort models and uh, yeah, as, as you mentioned, there are a couple of examples uh, where there are trade-offs. So, for example, if you um, open plants, uh, it, allowed, it allows for improved visual comfort, but at the same time, it also leads to, to thermal discomfort. Or at the same time, another example, if you have certain features that might improve daylighting, such as open spaces or reflective or hard surfaces, um, they may also increase instances for, for acoustic discomfort. So yes, that's that's an obvious um, matter of, of research right now, and um, I I'm afraid I can't give you a, a concrete answer on <laughs> on how these different um, IQ domains uh, influence each other. Um, but I hope that the ongoing research uh, will come to some conclusions very soon, so that we can provide a bit more more um, yeah advice with regard to that. Absolutely, I mean. In fact, it's an ongoing <laughs> process, not, not an easy question, this one. Thank you so much, Christian. Yeah. Um, Clarice, uh, about your chapter three, um, how can we incorporate occupant needs into the building design process for speculative buildings or other buildings for which the occupants are completely unknown? And is there a risk that we make certain assumptions about occupants that are incorrect and then the building fails to serve the ultimate occupants? Uh, thank you for the question. I think that answer to that depends on who pay the bills because depending on what arrangements we have on a speculative building in terms of uh, who pay the bills for certain parts of the building, then that will be more or less influenced by who is going to occupy the building. Uh, we just uh, been to the Healthy Buildings Europe last week, and an example that was given was a case study of an office building in which uh, the places were let, and then actually the tenant would pay the bill for the air conditioning uh, supply system and also the installation of the, 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 air, the, the air handling units and things like that. And therefore, uh, parts of the cost would be shared on the chillers and so on. Of course, this would be the responsibility of the building owner, but all the delivery system was the responsibility of the tenant. Therefore, they shared uh, uh, parts of the costs on that, which could maybe make them a bit more attentive to the needs of their company. Uh, so it depends a lot on who pay the bills and what the different parts of the building are in the hands of who is paying for it. Uh, and that will make them address more or less the, the, the needs of the occupants. Of course, if let's say it's a building that's going to be let and then the building owner pays like for everything, for all the capital costs, then the uncertainty is very high because it, in principle, you don't know who is going to be occupying the building. But still, if you use personas and if you use uh, techniques in which you can, which come from market research, in which you can potentially put together different occupant profiles, you could explore some design alternatives and scenarios with those and then work with the boundaries and work with robust design, as we pointed out in chapter eight. So I'm not sure I answered the question, but. You, you did. <laughs> you did, Clarice, like always. In fact, um, they, they are coming from the audience uh, to complement the questions that you were answering. They would say, would you please share the detail of the colleagues 
or a study that work on the multidimensional factors. I believe they are in the book, right? Yes, I think so, yes. They are all in the book. I think the, the beginning of the book, you have details for everybody that was involved in the writing. Is that correct, Liam? I don't know if it's in the beginning or the end. Maybe you can explain more about that. Yeah, it's at the beginning. Okay, perfect. And finally, we have a question for um, Clinton. I don't know if you want to answer them uh, or I will propose it and see if you can answer some other of the colleagues because Clinton unfortunately have to leave us after his presentation. It says, what are the costs and time delays associated with uh, collecting information about occupants? And do we expect these to pay for themselves? I can try to answer this very quickly. And Thank say, you, Liam. Uh, incorporating occupant perspectives and needs into the design process is a, a must, and um, the cost of, of not doing so is, is priceless. If you have dissatisfied occupants, um, that the cost associated with that will greatly exceed the cost of construction and, and energy use and maintenance and so on. Outstanding. Um, I think we have finished on time. <laughs> Perfect timing. A big thank you to the speakers and also to the audience for attending today's webinar. A reminder that we will be able to find, you will be able to find the recording of today's sessions on the Build Up portal and our YouTube channel in the coming days, together with the presentation slides. Um, again, thank you very much for the speakers. It was an outstanding webinar. Uh, we wish you all a very pleasant rest of the week. Thank you and goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.